and good afternoon. I'm Peter Goodwin, and uh, I have the pleasure of serving uh, currently as the lead scientist of the Delta Science Program. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about the science plan, and I'm glad I'm going first, because that's going to allow the other three speakers to pick holes in what we've done. And what I'd like to do is to give you uh, an appreciation of just how difficult it was pulling together a science plan when you have either state legislature and Congress on one side with certain expectations, which is basically saying, you know, damn it, you scientists just need to tell us what to do and we'll do it on one side. And then on the other side, you've got, uh, of course, a whole host of characters with very different ideas. So I'm going to spend a very little time, I think I'm going to skip over a few slides here and let the other speakers sort of um, try, try and build off some of the things that I'm saying. So where we started was by taking a very close look at, first of all, the trends in how science is being done in the US and globally. And then we took a look to see how the other large-scale ecosystem restoration programs were doing, uh, again, in the US. We took a look at some of the big European projects, uh, particularly on one of these seminars, my colleague, Philip Gorbersville, who's been put in charge of the environmental assessment of that massive artificial island in, uh, in Monte Carlo. So we've been looking at several programs. So how do you do this? How do you build a science program that can effectively inform policy? so that society makes the best possible decisions. And so here's a few things. I just picked this off. Um, uh, for those of you who uh, know Alan Blatecki, he's the Cyber Infrastructure Director at National Science Foundation. I think it, this is still the fastest growing division in the National Science Foundation. And this was his summary that he gave. You can actually go to his, um, uh, the, the web page here and listen to his presentation. But he said several things that really resonated with how uh, we might want to do things here in California. The first is that now science and scholarship are team sports. It's very unusual to see the brilliant uh, individual genius sitting in a broom cupboard somewhere coming out with a Nobel Prize. You know, the trend is the challenges, the problems are getting bigger and bigger and more complex. And so we have to work together in order to accelerate knowledge discovery. Uh, secondly, the way how we interact with each other, and I'd like to just g give you a link to Scott Miner's webpage if you d d don't know, um, sorry, Owen Miner, uh, talking about how tools and how computers are actually changing the way we do business. Then, of course, you've all read about big data and how that's changing the way we do science. And there's some really interesting philosophical discussions between folks who say, you know, why do we need models? Why do we need to set up hypotheses? Give me the data and I'll tell you the answer. And so, of course, I think coming from the modeling community, we'd say, well, that's fine. Stationarity is dead with the things we do and so on. But there's some really interesting discussions about what big data can actually tell us in the future. Uh, fourthly, um, community models. And gaming, virtualization, social networking are all changing the way how we communicate. So if you look at the science plan, I don't want to spend a lot of time on uh, PowerPoints. These are pretty boring. But firstly, we needed to identify the problem. And we spent the first three or four months going backwards and forwards with members of the Stewardship Council in public meetings, just trying to define what's the problem we're trying to solve. And here are some of the things which we heard. First of all, this is really urgent and high stakes. Uh, you know, I started my career um, working with Hugo Fisher, modeling the delta. We thought we had all the modeling sorted out back then. And everything we've learned since just shows how complex this system is. But the fact is, if we don't do something, the ecosystem's going to collapse. I'm sure you've heard about this. And secondly, we're going to have a really major disaster on our hands. And you've seen some of the projections of what that could do to the state and the national economy. The second thing was that we really need to view this as a system. This means going from the ocean to the watershed and building those connections. And using the word system is really important here because this is an open, rapidly changing and dynamic system. And the fact is that whatever we do to this system, we cannot be prescriptive in the outcomes. 
You, know, you might be able to do that on a 500 acre site perhaps, but when you're looking at this massive system with so many changes, it's not possible to say thou shalt have X at some time in the future. So how do you build the science uh, around that uh, knowledge and understanding? Uh, Stuart will already talk about this. Science should be done at the problem scale, uh, not at the postage stamp scale. And what became a very important issue is we went through these discussions not just with the council members, and it's really worth listening to them. Here are seven people, all hugely successful in their own fields, who are essentially donating their time to the state to try and create balance, they call it the, the, the co-equal goals. How do you create a more reliable water supply for California and at the same time uh, lead to greater resilience in the ecosystem and recovery of the ecosystem? So these are all very smart people coming out of different walks of, of life. But one of the things we had to say, that question, scientists tell us what to do and we'll do it, we have to say no, scientists can't do that. Science is not going to give you that. Because the ultimate decision that you make is going to be have some value of value in there. So the science can tell you so much, but how do you balance one endangered species against an, another? You, how do you balance your farmers or an industry in San Diego you're against some uh, ecological value in the north part of the state? So science can tell you what the consequences of the various decisions are but it can't actually make the decision for the politicians. Also here, it really struck me coming back, is that we have a, a culture of co combat science, I think was termed by uh, Dr. Mount here at UC Davis that got a lot of, um, uh, you, you, it gets a, a lot of airtime and litigation, and I'll give some examples of that in a moment. And also it's mission-driven silo science. This is not being critical of an agency, if you're an agency with a legal mandate to do something, recover a species, provide water, whatever that is, you're going to be gearing your staff and your objectives in order to achieve that mission. The difficulty is when you have, what is it, 231 different uh, your local government, state government, and federal government agencies, each with their own missions and ideas, how on earth do you begin to mesh those? Uh, adaptive management for a complex system, this will be covered by others. But you'll see it as part of that in the science plan. You'll also see, we spend a lot of time talking about infrastructure for science. This is looking at the future intellectual capacity to solve these problems, but also what's missing. Why isn't it that, uh, what are the barriers to, to scientists working across disciplines? And then of course, what resources are needed? So this is the science plan. It was, uh, the, the current version is December 2013. Some advice we got from uh, Dr. David Wagner in Washington, D.C., very interesting character. He was the guy that put together the artificial flood program on, Grand Ca on the Grand Canyon. He now heads up the Congressional Science Office for, um, for the environment and energy. And he said, forget about making the plan perfect. Get something out there, but tell people you're going to m monitor you're going to have performance metrics and you're going to come back and adjust as you go, which is what we've done. So here's the, the nuts uh, of the, and, and bolts of the science plan. And you can work your way from the bottom up and the top down. And what we realized is that the innovation and the ideas need to come up from the scientists who are actually on the ground. But at the same time, you have to have agency directors, you have Congress on board at the top looking down to make sure the resources and things actually happen. And this is how the science plan is derived. So the Policy Science Forum, there's several mechanisms for this without going into it in too much detail, but this is where you can sit down with agency directors. What's their big challenge? If you listen to Mark Cowan, it's how do I manage uncertainty? You, know, you can look at the projections, I know how much is out there. So you start out with these grand challenges at the top. And at the bottom, there's mechanisms by which the brilliant ideas can be implemented through uh, research activities. And that comes together through a science steering committee that translates those grand challenges, the really big things which are facing the agency directors on one side, and meshing that with what the scientists <coughs> might want to do at the other end. I mentioned you know, how are we doing with science. So, 
We have the state of data of science. It was put together by a previous lead scientist, Mike Healy, in 2008 with many, many co-authors. In fact, looking around the room here, there's probably at least four or five people contributed to that. We are updating that in 2014, which will be a base line, which will be saying not only what is our current common understanding of the science, but also what was the state of science before we started reorganizing ourselves. Uh, adaptive management, others will talk about that. With the, the importance of modeling, this is a very large, open, dynamic system. And like many other systems, this is actually an example taken from a, a large tributary to the Columbia. You know, we can build these conceptual models and link interdisciplinary models you know, to the conceptual models to try and understand the consequences of climate change of different management actions to, in this case, um, endangered species, sturgeon and uh, bull trout. And you, we do that everywhere. But if you look at the outcomes in, in, in California, particularly around the Delta, in terms of science, yes, this is an immensely complex system. And here I'm not diminishing you know, what, for example, has come out of BDCP. But when you're in this culture of litigation, and if you're standing up, 50 people are going to criticize you, either in public, in the courts, or whatever. It's very, very difficult for people to stand up and say, this is really what I think is going to happen. And so this is the BDCP summary where they shut all of the experts in the room from the agencies, looked at various modeling outputs, and came up with how they thought various endangered species Life cycle, parts of the life cycle it was likely to change under different management actions. And we end up with a series of nice coded boxes. Let's contrast that with um, a, pro a project in the Northwest. This is put out by some really outstanding scientists. So again, I'm not uh, being funny here, but they were running very quantitative models <laughs> and uh, saying that the increase is likely to go to, what, 285,302 coho salmon. <laughs> of course. So, so I put that out on the other end. Of course, these folks know exactly what they were doing. But there's a number there and quantitative models that people can tease apart. You substitute other disciplinary models to see how sensitive different things are. And so I just wanted to use this as a contrast that if we're too locked into this combat science and litigation, we really lose the ability to, you, to be brave, to throw out numbers like this. I think also here, because of the, the, the stress and the very, very high stake science, we've forgotten to use what uh, my colleague uh, Jörg Imberger refers to as academic loafing. And this is actually a term in philosophy. And he came up and really, he was on an independent review panel for one of our projects in the Columbia Basin. And he really beat up on us big time. And he said that he spent a day going through student posters and talking to researchers. And he said several things. First of all, everybody's exhausted. It was the end of the academic year. Uh, secondly, you're no fun to be around because everybody's tired. <laughs> and thirdly, because everyone's so exhausted, you weren't explaining yourselves very well. And he introduced us to this term, academic loafing, which surprisingly the National Sci Science Foundation didn't appreciate. But, <laughs> but what it is, we've forgotten to take the time to think and be creative. We're so busy you know, getting that next report out, doing that next study. How often have we actually had the time to sit back and be creative? And so part of the science plan, we're trying to get to that, to put resources to allow our best scientists to be creative. Uh, several other things, uh, managing scientific conflict, I won't go through this, but there's a whole series of steps in the science plan. How do you deal with scientific conflict? We know it's always going to be there, it's unavoidable. But how do we move these debates into the scientific arena where it can be conducted in a very su supportive and constructive way? And for those folks that want to come out of left field because they're a member of the National Academies and they're getting paid huge sums of money, they've been given two weeks and many thousands of dollars to express an opinion, and then it totally, they go to court and it totally undermines basically 90% of the scientists who are working on that. So in the science plan, you'll see there's a, a lot of mechanisms to try and prevent that scenario happening. Secondly, when our scientists 
are standing up in front of a judge or a public hearing. They should not be out there talking as Dr. So-and-so with such and such an agency. On these very tough issues, they should be talking on the basis of a body of knowledge. So, so as many of you know, we have the online journal, which was put out there to give a place for people to publish if you couldn't get it published um, you, you're in other journals. So Sam Luoma does a terrific job in getting the right sorts of papers into the journal. And so th this is all, you know, how do we build this common body of knowledge, firstly? And secondly, um, you know, how do we create that protection for folks, uh, our scientists who are out there? Two other things, part of the infrastructure, you can read the report, it's about 60 pages. But we recognized there were some really big gaps going on. First of all, in data management, I mentioned the era of big data. There's some really, really cool stuff going on. In fact, the full speaker, will she's been funding one of these initiatives. Really great stuff, absolutely cutting edge, but it's grant funded. $300,000 to take on something which really should be much bigger. And so the question is, how can we pull together these great initiatives? What sort of business model do you have so that if you're a student or, or you're someone working for Met down in MWD or your, your UC Berkeley, how do you get the data that you want to analyze quickly and easily? How do you find out where it is? And so this, uh, the first of the two summits will be in uh, June. Um, we think it's probably going to be hosted here at UC Davis. And the second is in the modeling arena without spending a lot of time, uh, Professor Lund has really guided our thinking from a 2005 report. This is another problem that we have in the Delta. Folks spent a lot of time producing really first-rate documents. In 2005, that was absolutely cutting edge, and yet it went nowhere. So we want to pick that up and to look at how do we build the interdisciplinary models, the integrated models that will allow your folks to work together to exchange data between models in a much more efficient manner. And here I just, uh, Wilson Miner, great talk uh, if you go to his web page. So with the modeling and the data interactions, your tools change how we interact with one another, how we behave, and therefore it changes our thinking. And if you just think back in the time that you've been in school, you, you're, how are those tools, the, what, what you're accessing, your smartphones, how's that actually changing the way that you were thinking compared with when you entered? I'm gonna skip over this and just leave you with this. So the science plan, um, I think it's been called you, you, ide you idealistic, um, but we need to make it realistic. Here are just a few of the what's in there, the common body of knowledge and a shared body of knowledge. It's inclusive, it's open, it's transparent. The peer review, and I didn't get into best available science, but the, that's a whole topic on itself. I can tell you it gets a knee-jerk reaction from most scientists. How, how can something be best available science for policymakers? Without going into it, as scientists, we have to deal with that because it's written into state and federal law. We cannot avoid it. Developing shared priorities through the uh, science action agenda. Basically, that's a four-year work plan. Uh, developing common, transparent, and accessible tools and managing scientific conflict. So I'm going to stop there and hopefully the, the next three speakers will blow holes in, in what's contained in the science plan itself. If I can just say one other thing, as m most of you are students, one of the things which we do, we've, we're facilitators of science, as I says. We have uh, great programs. We fund uh, research proposals just in the same way that NSF does, but we have two really cool and unique programs. One is Science Fellows with the goal of linking universities, your professor, with an agency to take on a, a big problem. And then we also have state fellows where you get assigned to a state agency. We hope uh, some of you will come and work with us. But it's an opportunity to take a full year out of your studies and come and work at the science policy interface. So check us out online. So thanks, Dr. Lam. Thank Um, well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's funny to jump into, I guess you guys have had a conversation over the past couple months about reconciliation ecology, which of course we haven't been part of. Um, 
But I have been hearing bits and pieces from this seminar, and I did get to spend a day with Michael Rosenzweig after he was here. We were both at a Google um, meeting, planning, discussion uh, for a day soon thereafter. So I got to interact a bit on these ideas. And um, so I, I've been really enjoying thinking about reconciliation ecology. And, um, and so I was thinking about what I like about reconciliation ecology um, as a term, as a concept. I like the idea, and I think I've been really pursuing this idea in my career, that it's really about you can maximize the ecological function in everywhere, not just in sort of your nat quote unquote natural areas, your wildernesses, your parks, but throughout um, suburbia, throughout into even urban areas, that there's, there's always probably some additional level of function that can be gained. So I really like how, how it has captured the idea, that idea, and that it's integrating with the built landscape, that there's so much of the land surface that could be uh, more functional, and especially agricultural areas too. Um, and that it does encourage thinking at the landscape scale above individual parcels or projects to you know, a much broader initiative. Um, here's the things I get, have gotten hung up on, um, is that even though it, I think it's supposed to be an add-on to restoration, it often is posed in conflict with restoration, it seems to me. Um, even though I think that's not, in, in theory, the intention, it does seem to be how it plays out often, is that sort of like you can either restore or reconcile. But when I read his book, and, and I think it really is, you try to do restoration where you can go big picture and really reestablish functions, and you do reconciliation where you can't do that. I think as a complementary thing, that seems to make most sense to me. And, and, and in truth, I find it hard to figure out where the divide is between one or the other of those, because really, I don't know that we have any true restoration at this point. It's all reconciliation, right? So, or it's all restoration. And I think the way we've always thought about it as F SFEI is it's restoration to something. And really, it's restoration to your goals, to your goals and objectives as a society. And you're informed by the way things used to function. You're informed by the way they function now. And you're tar but your targets are different from that. And so that's restoration, or that's reconciliation. Um, this is maybe a, a little bit of a, uh, harsh, but I think that it, it, um, I, it, I, I, I fear that it could lead us to think too small sometimes, and maybe not about the larger dynamics and physical processes that shape the landscape. Um, that that uh, you know we, you know we want to do what we can in these developed landscapes, but we also need to really make sure we're supporting resilience and dynamics at a, at a big enough scale that these things actually, these species can persist and adapt. And so sometimes I feel like it might short circuit us from really thinking what's necessary by just thinking what's possible. So, um, and those may change over time. So we wanna be thinking, having the long view and the big scale. Um, and when I say physical process, I also mean engineering. Um, you know, as realizing that um, landscapes are always being redesigned, flood control projects, um, agricultural crops, um, reservoirs, dams, pavement, the Bay Bridge, everything has a fairly short life cycle, like 50 years, 75 years, um, sometimes even quicker. And so we don't want to assume everything is sort of fixed and given. I mean, this is what Stuart works on, right, is the interface between engineering and landscapes. Um, water infrastructure is going to be reshaped over the next decades. So we want to be thinking at a big scale about what ecology is necessary. <laughs> Did I put that in there? Um, it, it, the term can sound a little capitulation ecology or something. And like, <laughs> just like you go to a mediation session and no one's that happy and like, okay, that's what we do. Like, I don't know, it seems like we need to be inspiring. And I think it can be very inspiring, but um, somehow that's how I got rubbed at times. So, um, so I think the idea is that we're trying to move you know, our priorities just from people towards ecosystem. And, and I guess I was worried that sometimes we might sell ourselves short and just end up in here. Um, so I was just going to give three examples, hopefully super quick, of what I think uh, reconciliation ecology that we're involved in. One is for the delta. Um, and this is trying to take um, the analysis that uh, Allison Whipple, who's here in large part, led, um, reconstructing the historical functions of the delta um, and translating it into con analyzing past and present how things have changed, and trying to project what's possible at the landscape scale. And just a quick example, how you want to be thinking about physical processes and the overall setting. Here's looking at this little spot 
in the delta, the McCormick-Williamson tract, and we put it in a physical setting of natural levees, which are all, of course, still there along the river, sort of Pleistocene era landscape that's been created. Um, the topographic, is there a button on here? For, um, word? Is there a pointer, Peter? Is that, okay, there we go. The, um, you know, the, the sh these basins that were shaped by being positioned in between the fan and the levee and this natural pinch point down here, which caused backup and flooding there. These things are hardwired into the landscape. And if we just look at fields and plants and, you know, birds and butterflies, and we don't actually look at this level of, of how the landscape works, we're going to be missing the bigger opportunities. So that, you know, that, that really shape what's possible. So when we overlaid, uh, to cut a long story short, the historical landscape over that contemporary photo, you see actually a lot of elements still remaining that actually is still there in the landscape, like these natural levees and the basins, these low spots. That topography is actually still there in the delta at the margins. You know, we mostly focus on the subsided majority of the delta in the middle, but once you get on the periphery, it's amazing that the remnant topography is that's there. And in some places, like here, you have on the uh, Kasumnus River a pretty decent hydrograph, some sediment supply. But uh, no one was talking about this natural levee as an incredible uh, uh, opportunity to restore you know, broad riparian forest using natural processes. And that's still not actually really in the equation because there's too many constraints right now. But in the long run, that should be part of our vision, is creating a functional, resilient landscape with a number of elements that add up over time. And so we thought about that, that you try to have this vision in the future, and you can't get there um, for a while, because we're stuck at this scale with projects. But if you have that vision, then you reconcile through step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And this is how, hopefully, we reconcile at the broader scale over time multiple decades. All of these things take a long, long time. Um, another example, taking it an, even a step further towards engineering, is a, a project we're involved in. It's funded by the EPA called Flood Control 2.0. A lot of folks are involved. And um, this is trying to integrate uh, sort of landscape scale ecological thinking with uh, the need to redesign flood control channels in many cases. How can we do it better this time around? And uh, I think the short answer is that, yeah, it's possible probably to do that differently this time around, but it's not very easy, or automatic. It's a lot of responsibility for flood control agencies. And so among what's needed is more is science that helps them integrate and the tools, sort of as Peter was talking about. I'll show you an example of where we've gotten in one part of the bay where it had this sort of basic format of different kinds of marsh, I won't get into the characteristics, but say this is a marsh, this is the land over here, this is the bay. Stuart knows this area. Um, and now almost all of those habitats are gone. But the vision that a team of scientists came up with, working with the engineers for the future, and this is very draft, and kind of pie in the sky at this point, but a long range vision, is a real integrated approach that reconciles flood protection with uh, restoration, with tidal marsh restoration, using tidal prism to hopefully increase the uh, transport of sediment and redu reduce flooding up here and uh, deal with these sediment management challenges, kind of reduce dredging and provide a way that, that sediment can be moved out into a kind of natural delta type area. And then also part of this, ideally in the long run, would be reuse of wastewater, um, creating brackish zones. So this is starting to reconcile a lot of different aspects of you know, of our landscapes from water reuse to sediment reuse, um, tidal prism and restoration, et cetera, et cetera. A third totally different type of example I tossed in here, um, oak savannas. This is, again, Allison's research. Um, we uh, discovered that many of the valleys throughout California were covered with these beautiful oak savannas that uh, were really kind of ecological um, touchstones or, or keystones in the landscape. They support so many species, only trees that can really live out in these hot, dry landscapes much of the, in many places. And they were uh, much appreciated by people at first, by, well, certainly by native peoples, 
um, extensively, and then by uh, early European settlers because they provided the only shade in many of the valleys in the hot summer. So they were so towns were built into the groves, but then with agriculture, they competed with uh, orchards, and so they're basically incredibly diminished and uh, you know, almost not extirpated, but but incredibly gone. So there's very little in the way of savanna, but if you look closely, these trees actually persist within developed landscapes a lot. And the more you look, the more you see. You guys see that all around Davis. And uh, in the agricultural areas, too, this is a wonderful linear oak savanna that um, has even a mixed age canopy. Look, little trees, big trees. It's shading the road, mostly because it's on the south side and only shading the vineyard a little bit. It's keeping it cool. Uh, that's a really functional piece of, of ecological infrastructure. That's reconciliation right there. And so we had this idea that you could re-oak. You could go from this kind of pattern of scattered trees to almost obliterating that ecological resource by the 1940s and then sort of continued decline. But there's really nothing stopping this kind of thing from coming back. And it's not going to support all the characteristics of an oak savanna, like the ground dwelling birds probably going to have a hard time. But a lot of the uh, other birds and bat species could actually really use this. And if they're close enough together, they can actually communicate genetically. And so potentially have more adaptability over time, whereas now they're isolated typically in landscapes. So this is an example of re-oaking potentially at a broad scale throughout suburban landscapes. And to support a lot of different ecosystem services, really. So um, in closing, I tossed out our newest idea at SFEI, which is kind of uh, really focusing on these ideas of how do you get the right people and tools together to envision these kinds of landscapes that are resilient, that are reconciled. And that's we actually just got our first seed funds for the, the incipient Center for Resilient Landscapes last week. So thanks a lot. I'll close there, turn it over to Stuart. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Stuart Siegel. I uh, run a small consulting firm in Santa Fe and have been doing wetland restoration work in, throughout the estuary for about 30 years now and have uh, over that time gotten very engaged in doing a lot of regional planning and applied science research. Uh, been a lot of very fun stuff to my PhD along the way to make it interesting. Um, so I'm only going to take a few minutes here and I actually have an hour and a half version of this which obviously you won't get today and uh, there's probably more like a two hour version to really um, hammer that down. So I'm really trying to pick out just a handful of topics that will be just a, a, a few pieces here. There's, there's, there's a lot more to communicate to you than we can do in a um, short period of time. Um, but like, what I kind of want to talk about is the notion of how you get at what you ought to do. And this has been an interesting challenge because I spent a lot of time with Delta Vision and, and everyone has their view of what's going on, what they ought to do and they're oftentimes very divergent, and we land at a place today where we don't necessarily have a very good handle on what it ought to be, which is why we talk about science and reconciliation. And one of the things that we, we tried to do a few years ago was understand how we got into the mess we're in, look at the questions of, of that mess, what can we change, and therefore what can we fix? And I think, the, and Peter Moyle is really, we, we always call it a restoration ecology, and Peter is really one that's advocated reconciliation, because we're reconciling what we'd like to do with what we can do. And uh, what was it your term you just used is um, capitulation. capitulation science, thank you. You know, there's a lot of things that we can't fix. But if you don't know why we have a problem, the chance of you fixing it is incredibly low. And that's a key piece is you gotta understand what, what we have and haven't done. You know, so we made a lot of changes to the system. And we, we didn't do it with the intention to mess up the ecosystem. We did it because we wanted gold. We wanted water. We wanted flood protection. We wanted agriculture. All kinds of things that society valued um, from statehood on and before even. And all of those things done fully independent of each other altered how the place works. And there's a whole bunch of natural uh, processes that drive modern ecosystem function and, uh, and, and what was here historically. And we went in and changed everything in all sorts of varying ways with no intention whatsoever and no design. And we're left with that system today. And so, for example, there's this big effort to fix California water supply. And so if you were to ask the question, well, we have all this water in the north of California and we want to send it all to San Joaquin Valley and, and south for a water supply, how would you engineer a system that would do that well? And I can guarantee you what we have today is not what you would do. 
there's a lot of things we do very differently. But we, we walked into, we backed into today's system that we're trying to see how we can fix. All those um, altered processes give us what we see today that we don't like. You know, in the list of endangered species, poor water quality, loss of habitat, all kinds of things that, that they're just the indicators. We're not, that when we fix things, we're not fixing the indicators. They, they change because we fixed the processes up here. And that's a key piece here, that we work on this. Those, if we have it right, will follow suit. Um, getting it right is really critical. So I worked on this coastal lagoon in Half Moon Bay. And we were supposed to do this feasibility study. How can we make the lagoon like all the rest of the lagoons up and down the central coast? They support uh, steelhead. And almost every lagoon on the central coast is a flooded river valley. And so you have a beach, you have an open and opens and closes with storms. And then behind it is a bunch of wetlands and a subsided valley that's filled with sediment over time. And everyone, that's people's conceptual model of how the place works and that was applied here. We took some existing data and got a little bit of new data, which is elevation, and discovered this particular lagoon is perched well above sea level. It's an incised creek channel through a marine terrace and a little riparian strip that drops onto the ocean. So every idea that you would have had to restore this lagoon like most lagoons in California coast would have failed because it was the wrong geomorphology of the system. And when we figured this out and presented this, everyone's jaws dropped. They're like, we have been spending 10, 15 years planning a Pescadero here and Pescadero will fail unless you do an awful lot of digging, which nobody wants to do. And so it's really, you have to get into the details of how your place works and understand your landscape in order for anything you're gonna do to have a chance of working. Um, you go to the very opposite scale. So that was one creek, one beach at Half Moon Bay. And the funny thing there was all these issues about snowy plovers, you can't do field work. Every weekend there's a thousand kids on the beach running rampant out there. And we have all these restrictions on you know, where we put our foot and we have a survey rod. So, so this is uh, the opposite end of that spectrum, which is the idea of the landscape scale. And so if you're gonna try to improve the landscape, you have to understand how it works and all the processes that control it. So when you go back to what we messed up, you ask today, what is going on? And so Susun Marsh is a very large area. It's about 100,000 acres. And if you wanna do restoration, you have to understand things like the topography. It's a subsided landscape, just like the Delta, but much less so. You have a set of elevations that, that presents you. If you threw a bunch of sea level rise and didn't do anything, and this is uh, with, with no action 100 years later, with five feet of sea level rise, the place goes deeply under. So understanding the, the, the geomorphology of the landscape is really critical. And then because most wetlands are subsided, and if you want to have vegetated wetlands, so this, this slide here shows the elevation range at which wet, tidal wetland plants grow with salt. And so when you're in a very salty environment, they grow up near the top, they can't handle the inundation and the salt. So the plant species that grow in, in tidal marshes, salt, tidal salt marshes are sitting near the top, they're kind of a veneer. When you get into a freshwater system like the delta, they can grow below low tide. So tules can go maybe a couple feet below low tide, a huge vertical range in elevations. And when you're in a brackish environment like Sassoon, you're somewhere in the middle and depends on where you are in the system if you're more this way or more this way. And so understanding where plants can grow relative to salt and your vegetation is a big piece. And then so if you're gonna do restoration and if you want emergent vegetation and a, and a marsh that, that matures back up, which is, has long-term resiliency, then you gotta fill the place back up and you have a choice. You do it with sediment that comes into the tides or plants or a combination of the two. And then so you ask yourself the question, well, what's the sediment supply look like in the system? And what do you have to work with? And so there's a basic gist that there is more sediment in the southern part of Susun than there is in the north, except for a little, there's a small bay there, the wind blows and kicks up the mud and very locally you have a sediment supply. You have some transport around the system, but sites way up here are gonna have much less sediment supply for the most part, and therefore that process of restoration will go slow. When you're down in the south of Susu Marsh, you have more access to sediment and those sites would accrete much more rapidly. So knowing your sediment supply and how that works, and, and this then you step back even further and look at the sediment that comes in from the Central Valley watershed, it moves into Susu Marsh and then ultimately down to San Francisco Bay, and that's changing. We had this thing called gold mining. We dumped in however many billions of cubic yards of sediment into the system, and a lot of that is now working its way out of the system the more recent work is suggesting that the supply of sediment into the bay is on its way down. We crossed the threshold about 10, 15 years ago. We built dams, we've managed, we have this huge effort on water quality managing sediment. And if you're a salmon person, it's about water temperature and water clarity. And if you're in the delta, it's about turbidity. You know, you're, it's the exact opposite. You want that sediment in the water column for fish in the delta, but you don't up in the watershed. Um, then you have to look at 
how water moves around the system and how that moves particles. Part of restoration is the habitat itself. Part of it is that marshes import and export materials and how does that move around. So if you're producing food for fish and the fish don't go in there, but you want the fish to get that food, that, that food has to leave and go somewhere. So how do the tides mix around the whole system there? Um, and how does sea level rise accommodate? If you have a nice gentle slope, as sea level rise happens, your wetlands can go in. Um, if it's, you know, most of the bay, for example, is a hard shoreline, there's no room. And in some places, a lot of places are kind of steep. The delta has a huge amount of gentle, um, but it's all agricultural land, and you get in this conflict between land uses. Um, so I'm a big fan of conceptual models. And when I was doing work for CalFed, we came up with this approach to organize conceptual models are thought organization tools and nothing more. They're not the end all, they're just to help you think something through. And so what we do here for uh, water quality in Susu Marsh, the duck clubs, for example, we're interested in dissolved oxygen concentrations and there's a problem out there. There's times that it's called black water and they kill fish and we're trying to fix that. And so we use this conceptual model tool which talks about, uses the, the, the size of the arrow to indicate the relative importance of a particular controlling process. We use the color of the arrow to describe how much we know about it. Sometimes we have great knowledge, sometimes we're, we're really speculating. And then the process itself might be very predictable. The tides you can chart out huge in advance. Will it rain on Tuesday? We don't know. And so you put all these pieces together and then we added the piece that if you're gonna try to manage the system, what knobs can you turn and what knobs are outside your control? And so everything in red is something where you might have a management control. And so this is just a tool and nothing more to help you decide if you want to improve water quality, what kind of things might work, which ones are important, which ones will actually take you and really hit the bell strong, so to speak. And these are a critical piece, and these don't exist for a lot of things that matter right now. If you're trying to restore for delta smelt or salmon in the delta, this doesn't exist. There's a few ideas, and it doesn't put things in this form, so if I'm doing a restoration project and I want to support delta smelt, there's not a single conceptual model that says that, that microbial respiration is a whole lot more important than photosynthesis or rainfall, it doesn't exist. And so it makes it very hard and that's the challenge. And so then when we doing Delta Vision, we, we have this idea that there's this ultimate goal. We wanna improve the ecosystem, this idea of ecosystem resiliency and the co-equal goals. And there's a lot of things to do there. And we have this odd focus. So restoration is what I do and everyone thinks it's very important and it is, but there's these two other things in the mix here, which is processes, which might be flow, for example, delta outflow or inflow of the delta is a good example. And then there's all kinds of stressors. There's entrainment, there's water quality issues, stuff. You gotta do all these things. The key here is all that gets packaged up going back to how we mess the system up, what you might wanna do, and you can't focus on any one of these things. It's a combination of them all. And then lastly, what I'll say is because this is essentially a, a, a version of the slide that um, Robin had is, when you don't really know the answer to how a delta smelter salmon uses the delta, you can step back and say, well, historically, it looked like this. There's all kinds of characteristics it had. The key thing was a lot of habitat, but also this thing called variability, that there was a lot of variability in every aspect of the environment, somewhere in that system, at some day, everywhere. And, and today, we have incredibly low variability. And so we don't have all those things, all those places. So if you're an organism, you, you can't find a place that works for you very easily. And so if you don't know exactly what you have to do, you step back to the scale, which is what Robin and Allison have worked on, and try to say, well, how did it work at a big picture? And what can, of that can we put back in the system and try to make it work? And I think I'll close with that. Thank you. Um, my name is Val Connor, and I um, took um, evolutionary ecology in this room back in 1981. Um, so. Um, the chairs still squeak. <laughs> um, I, I now work for the State and Federal Contractors Water Agency, and that is a joint powers authority, and the member agencies um, are the folks that try to export water out of the south part of the Delta. So um, either getting their water through the State Water Project or the Central Valley Project. And so um, the JPA has is, is been formed to do a couple of things, but one of them is, is that the biological opinions require a lot of restoration. They require 8,000 acres of restoration with the idea that we can provide a food subsidy for delta smelt and then 17,000 acres of salmon, uh, either floodway or um, restoration habitat to again improve chances of, of salmon survival. And I, I have to say that with delta smelt and habitat restoration, um, 
there is an awful lot that we don't know and that we need to learn uh, so that we can do this effectively. Um, and one of those questions is, is, can we do it effectively? And so that's one of the challenges that I have is that um, my agency is starting with a couple of, of the um, first out of the shoot restoration projects. And so we're trying to decide um, how to monitor those and how to adaptively manage them. And so this talk was actually prepared um, by somebody else. It's not me. I'm not Ramona Swenson, but she did it for our agency, so I decided I could steal it. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is last week we had an annual workshop of the folks doing science in the Delta. And the piece that makes the most sense to talk about now is piece three, which is monitoring and evaluating restoration projects. And so obviously what we need to do for these projects is, um, in terms of defining success, is, is where are we trying to get? And so with the 8,000 acres that we're focused on initially, we know that what we're trying to do is restore areas that can produce fish food, essentially food subsidy for fish like delta smelt and longfin smelt. But restoring a really small piece, one piece at a time, it's not like you're going to see a change, that you're going to see this immediate rebounding of delta smelt. And so in terms of what we're looking at, we have to think a little more locally in terms of what indicators do we think are important if we're trying to build um, a system that's going to produce food for delta smelt. And so the conceptual model that we have is that if you take a restoration action, you're going to have, kind of building on what Stuart said, these physical processes um, that's going to interact with the physical habitat. And that's going to create biological habitat. And we're hoping for some functional outcomes. And so the part of it that I'm focused on is designing the monitoring um, and assessment program for the projects that we're building. And so again, what we're trying to do is um, see, are we moving these restoration sites in the direction where we're going to be producing food for endangered fish species? And so the first thing that we have is we actually were lucky enough to work with Robin on our first site uh, so he could tell us what the historic ecology was. Uh, and so the design is, is based on that. But we're really thinking about sort of the, the, the food web restaurant that we're trying to create. So if we have um, the restoration action and we start to um, take down some berms and some levees. And so we start getting tidal inundation. You know, we're starting to let it cook. Um, we need to see if we're going to be producing food. And you can either produce that food in sight, um, or you really do have to be seeing if whether or not the food that you're producing is being exported. And so the way that we've looked at this really is for our monitoring we have three types. We have to do compliance monitoring, which is we have to prove to the federal fish agencies that, yes, you said we had to do, um, you know, build 8,000 acres, so we're going to do that. We've got a plan. We can show that, yes, we implemented the plan as designed. But that doesn't really tell us if the site's working. So the next thing that we have is, is effectiveness monitoring. And here we're looking at a combination of what's going on at our site and what's going on in the region. And because we don't know very much, um, we're just frankly admitting that. And we're trying to design the site so that we can do experiments. So if you're trying to produce fish food, um, one of the things that you need is you need sufficient residence time so that you can have um, nutrient cycling producing phytoplankton and zooplankton. So the site's been designed in a way that will allow us to control tidal circulation patterns and residence time so that hopefully we can come up with an approach um, that does maximize our ability to produce um, food for fish. And then in terms of seeing whether or not that's effective, again, this first piece for us, this is 1,000 acres. We don't expect to see a dramatic response in delta smelt and to respond to this 1,000 acres. And so um, it's not like we're going to be monitoring delta smelt. So we're going to be looking at indicators um, that would suggest we're increasing production and that that production is moving off site. So looking at phytoplankton and zooplankton and then working with USGS to actually look at flux um, off the site. Um, the challenge is, is that our little piece has to fit together with the regional piece. So we've got sort of these different scales that are interacting. And we want to make sure that the work that we do at our site informs the regional picture as well as the, the landscape picture. And so we're working closely with the fish agencies now to try and figure out um, anything that we can monitor in the same way where comparability makes sense. We're trying to do that. And so I have to say the biggest challenge now is that we have the science plan, and we all agree that that's our North Star. Um, but we're starting to restore while we're building these systems to help us do restoration effectively. So it's like we're driving the car um, as we build it. 
and um, I don't even have a driver's license. But um, so that's where we're really relying on um, the Delta Science Plan because it does lay out a vision for how we can work together and how investigations at, at different scales, so I'm doing the little postage stamp piece, um, can fit into our understanding of, of regional wide and um, system wide. So this is our project. We already know that there's going to be um, Liberty Island already exists. Prospect Island's going to come online in hopefully a year. No? Oh. <laughs> um, Okay. <laughs> um, in, in a couple of years. But so what we're trying to do is um, look at the impact that these projects will have on one another, again, so that when we build them, um, we're doing it in a broader context, sort of building on the lessons that Robin talked about. And so he talked to you about McCormick-Williamson tract um, in the East Delta. And so um, I, I think that there is agreement that we have to do this um, smarter than we've done it in the past and that we need to coordinate. And I think pretty much everybody is on board to do that. Um, even the contractors. So I'll stop at that so you can catch up on time. <laughs> we should have all the panelists come back up. And we'll have some questions and discussion. No one's talking about mercury. Is this a game changer or are we... Not about it. Oh, we're very worried about mercury. I, I can talk a little bit about it, and you probably can as well. Um, there are what are called total maximum daily loads um, that have been developed by the water boards for mercury. Unfortunately, there's two water boards in this system, and so the Central Valley Regional Board has a different plan of attack than the um, San Francisco Bay um, Regional Board, and so people are, are, are struggling with that. But you're, you're right that there's a um, huge concern that when you start building wetlands that you're going to start methylating mercury. And so there are several projects that are going on now looking at that. At the Yolo Wildlife Basin out here, if you go out there on the weekend, you can go. There's a series of ponds that have been built specifically because you can control wetting and drying um, so that they're starting to look at different management measures um, and how that affects mercury methylation. But anybody that's building a restoration project in the Central Valley region, so that includes the Yolo Bypass, it includes Lower Yolo, um, we all have to evaluate the mercury methylization risk of our sites. And uh, mercury monitoring is incredibly expensive. And so um, folks are, are sort of forming um, collaborative teams so that they can say, okay, what is this site? What, what, what can we learn most from Lower Yolo versus what could we learn from McCormick Williamson? Uh, and so we're putting together these plans. We had to submit them to the regional board, um, and then the regional board will approve them. But so it may not be that every single piece has mercury monitoring associated with it, but you have to be part of this bigger effort. And if you're doing restoration work, you know, contribute to the kitty or contribute um, your site. And so the Lower Yolo Ranch site, the way it's been designed and the way we're setting it up with instruments will allow us to determine flux. And so we're working with USGS to make sure that we can um, really look closely, again, at circulation patterns and holding time um, to get a handle on mercury methylization at that site. I would say from a, a tidal marsh, mercury methylization is very dependent upon the environment you're in. And so the big problem areas are places that stay dry for a long time, wet for a long time, dry for a long time, wet for a long time. So Yola Bypass floodplains are perfect melt the mercury factories, just the nature of how their hydrology is. Uh, a lot of the duck clubs in Susun Marsh are the same way. They're dried out in the summertime, they flood up, they're just they're huge factories. And then, then they get to tidal marshes that, that flood and drain every single day. And there's been probably 15, 20 years of work now on this. And the, and the very recent uh, findings are that in places where the tides come in out every day is a very minimal to non-issue for mercury methylization. It's, it's too rapid of an inundation regime to produce much methylmercury at all. And in a lot of these restorations, the mercury that was in the soil is getting buried by sediment, and so the, 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 the fuel is being buried. Um, and the places where it is a risk is when you're in tidal marshes to get up into the higher elevations that don't get the tides, that daily inundation back and out. Then you're getting into those longer cycles where there's more of a risk there. And so that, that's, it's finally, and the researchers I went to this big meeting in December, they're like, okay, we think we've determined that most tidal marshes are non-issue, for, for tidal marshes, and we can kind of move on now, which is a huge revelation. It's taken years for them to get to that point and, and really 
uh, ease up. But as Valerie mentioned, there's a big difference between the regional board in the San Francisco Bay and Central Valley. They look at things differently. So those things have to feed their way into the regulatory system. Yes. More questions? <coughs> I know, it's not that late. Um, every other year we have a Delta Science conference. But not many <coughs> people show up for this thing. How come we don't have all this stuff figured out? If we've had 900 people working on this thing for 10, 10 years or more. <laughs> <laughs> you, you all have worked in the system for quite some time. I'm sure you have, have given this some thought. Well, one thing I will say that, that, that you heard Val mention is one of the best ways to learn is to do, and do things and extract knowledge from them. And so we haven't done a lot yet. And so when, when you look at what happens at restoration, there aren't that many implemented restoration projects on the ground to go to and extract knowledge from. And you can go back to older wetlands and do that to an extent. So we're not making mistakes fast enough. C correct. Pretty much true. Right. I would agree with that. Right. That, you know, in the Delta, we have done... There's been a couple natural restorations, a few, and then there's been one intentional restoration that's about the size of this room, a little bigger than this, and that's it. And so we're getting close to implementing a few, and then people don't want to pay for it, it's expensive. And, and then you have to, this goes back to science, is that when you want to go extract knowledge, you have to walk in with a conceptual model. I think that, and this place will do X, therefore I'm gonna, Manipulate design so we can maybe get some knowledge. And I'm going to look at it in ways that tell me whether what I thought was going to happen is happening. And, and that's a different kind of uh, data collection than, than sort of the regulatory compliance to other plants there as a water circulate and all that kind of stuff that Val was mentioning is very basic. And so um, we're getting close. The fact that they have a project that is soon to be built, we actually start getting uh, some, some samples in the system. And then you have to ask what's most important. And that, and I, I mentioned before, there is not a definitive statement that says delta smelt need this and salmon need that in the delta and therefore look for these exact things. There's ideas, but it's not pinned down to this is more critical than that. And so we can use these things to help, we can choose to use them to help refine our understanding if we choose to. Yeah, another <clears throat> aspect I've noticed, because um, now that we've studied the delta and have studied the bay quite a bit, <clears throat> is the, um, just the extreme transformation of the delta is actually much more than the bay. Like the bay actually had 83% um, tidal wetland loss. So that sounds pretty bad, but that means there were still a bunch of chunks left. And so people did dissertations there. You know, Stuart did research in the bay, right? Mm -hmm. Did your dissertation. Many people studied the tidal marshes and the endangered species that we have in the bay, they've been studied in sort of their natural environment you know, clapper whales or salt marsh harvest mice, they've been studied in marshes. Whereas in the delta, it's got 97, you know, it's got incredibly extreme loss. And so you have delta smelt living in a completely unnatural environment. And we have all these questions about what they would actually do in their natural, in a more natural environment. So we don't really know. There's nothing to study. Nobody has done dissertation. You know, nobody, very few people have actually studied wetlands in the delta. And so we have this weird gap the system is probably the dominant wetland system in the entire west coast of North America, and nobody knows has ever really studied it. You, know? you have to study it with modeling because you don't have it. Right. right. Or in the past. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so I get a few other questions in a moment, but I think it's very interesting to compare the bay to, to the delta. And you have to ask, why could people do dissertations in the bay? And the reason for that is that there was a willingness amongst agencies and some very big thinkers, way back in the 70s, Curtis Faber and people like that, who encouraged you know, some of the early wetland restorations where we knew it was going to be driven by physical processes. And basically, let's just take a highly sediment creek and let's just see how the wetland evolves in a certain area. And there was a lot of studies on that, and there was a sequence of these uh, experiments, each one doing a little more engineering. But I think it was the willingness of the agency, the willingness of you know, you know, Vince and folks to put their students on this to do the monitoring, that, that actually led to the um, incredible experience. And much of that collective knowledge you know, has gone into what the Corps of Engineers called the Manual and 
Yeah, that stuff's used all over the world now. This is 40 years of restoration experience. Stuart's right now, I, now it's starting to get, it's almost a Because right. it's hard when you've got a huge island to partly restore it and yeah. experiment with scale. But I think that's part of it, but also, yeah, it's, it's this willingness to, um, if we get too locked up <clears throat> around your permits for this and that, or, or having too much um, prescriptive, this is what's going to be the outcome of this site, then we're just going to get locked up because there's so much uncertainty in the system. In the Bay, my problem Bay, is there was 83% loss, which means 70% retention. And there are some very large patches of natural wetlands left in San Francisco Bay. And so this notion from the wetland science field is you compare your restoration site to a reference site. And you could sort of kind of do that in San Francisco Bay. There were places to go and extract some pretty insightful knowledge. There is nowhere in the delta. There are, of the few percent left, that represents a hundreds of little tiny patches. And so there aren't half a million acres. There aren't a thousand acres. There's little five acre patches here and there, mostly in channel islands left. And, few on the banks of some islands. There's, there's nothing. And then there are sites that have been restored through natural levee failures that have been studied a little bit. That's all there is. A hundred scientists could do a lot better with these little patches. They could study it more intensely. Right. But you know, this is the only large ecosystem that I know of where there is significant pushback against trying to do things like control nutrients or do restoration. And so I, I understand what you're saying, but I think we have to um, be pretty clear that it's sort of the socio-political situation that we have that has sort of led us to where we are now and what we're trying to dig out of um, by having the science plan. Yeah, yeah, I think we can all appreciate that. But when you then look at San Francisco Bay, um, I mean, and you look at all of the values and industries and people using that. Right? I mean, it, it's hard to, to think that the Delta is so much worse. Is it? I mean, really? In terms of population density, we have a lot more people who get easily offended around San Francisco Bay than we should have around the Delta. Yeah. Or there's different land uses. So, yeah. so. There were, there were two major research projects on the wetlands that do exist. They're both restored. So there's Sherman, the western part of Sherman Island opened in the 20s. And then Liberty Island Little Holland Tract opened in the 80s and 90s. And there have been two pretty major research projects. But they're, they're, they're very hard to work in. And there's a lot of human challenges. So I did the work at Sherman. And people stole our equipment. They burned the marsh down. And there's pot farms out there. And the Coast Guard's on you in your boat. What do you, are you guys the pot farmers? And so there are some really pragmatic issues about extracting knowledge when your equipment disappears on you. You put $10,000 worth of gear, and you try to hide it and everything, and someone comes and goes snip and takes your instruments. And then, well, they, where's the rest? They literally burn the marsh up, which might be for nutrient recycling for pot farms. Who knows? And there's a whole different culture. And this is absolutely pragmatic. And so when you're a researcher, it's nice to go do this work in the wetlands. But when you have the Coast Guard with guns drawn boarding your boat to see what you're up to out there, it's not the most convivial environment to do field work in. And that's, it's, it is a challenge. I want to follow up on something that Val said. Um, you're all scientists who are advising policy makers, or in some cases policy advocates, and you're doing so with respect to what has got to be the most politicized, controversial ecosystem in California right now. Um, many of the students in this class want to follow your lead and do precisely that kind of work. So with that background, my question to each of you is, what's your greatest challenge in advising policymakers? <laughs> that monitoring doesn't cost, it pays. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, that's a good one. I think there's also the, the recognition that you can't sometimes do science on schedules, particularly in such a complex system as this. So, so your commitment to science needs to be a continuing co commitment to match the rapidly changing system. I think that's part of it. I, I think the second is that science cannot alleviate the policy makers from making those decisions. As I, I mentioned before, we, it was a fa fascinating discussion there, I don't know if you were there. But just this difference, you make a decision based on science, there's a science, and then there has to be some sort of value judgment in that. And 
that's quite a difficult message to, you know, to get across. But I think also sometimes it's just for those folks, not always, we, we're very uh, fortunate here just to have some really smart agency directors that have come up through the ranks. But when you move out, say, into the state legislature, um, just understanding that what their question is, or helping them understand how to pose the question so that science can be organized to respond to that. So they're not just acting you're on the basis of what someone went to DC said and then came back fourth hand and someone's under mm -hmm. pressure, pressure here. So I hope the solution to that is to get a much greater understanding. And a lot of the thinking behind the policy science forum was at many different levels to try and uh, improve the dialogue because it is difficult. And I'll just finish there. When I first, the first time I met Phil Eisenberg, it was at Aquaterra in 2009. And there they pulled together all, all of the folks working on the low lying areas on the planet. And the idea was to try and have a, a UN special designation. And Phil, in his normal style, although the success he can't remember saying this, he came in and he said, How many of you are uh, scientists? And about a third of the people in the room put their hands up and he said, well, uh, so you're just used to dealing with these damn politicians that don't understand a thing. And then he asked the same question to politicians. And you can never get a straight answer out of the scientists. And then if you're a manager, you're sort of cooking in between. And then he said, he just stopped and he said, get used to it, you live in three different worlds and you have to work with it. And I think that's really you know, the challenge that we face. Because the science is, is not the problem or, on almost any issues out there. I don't know how the other panelists feel. But there's the expertise here to make reasonable um, assessments or to design a science project to do certain things. The difficulty is, as you say, right at this science policy interface. And we're not very good at it in the ultimate democracy. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess just as a follow-on to that, um, for all of you guys, I guess what are some of the best examples of what you've seen working in the Delta as far as how reconciliation happens, how you bring the science into these conversations? Is it um, you know, how do you have these opportunities to have academic looking within your with your colleagues? Um, but then have those conversations um, branch into bigger conversations with the people who, with the politician. Um, I guess some, with some of the structure that's being built in the Delta that you really see promising and exciting working with. Good examples. I've got a couple of them. <laughs> Well, it was a project that Stuart and I and Val were all part of on, on Lower Yolo, and that, that convened a bunch of scientists to sort of discuss and debate what, what would make most sense there. And I thought that was, that was, that was fun. Like, that was a big thinking, and um, everyone got all their ideas out on the table, and people kind of coalesced around similar ideas. I would say Prospect Island, we had that tack mm -hmm. last week. I mean, I think those, those kind of collective discussions where you get people focused in a room for, for a day. Um, but we don't have you know, a real structure for that yet. And I think that's something that there's been a lot to talk about, is, is you know, having more of a hub or something, as Campbell Ingram has been calling it, that um, you know, organizes those, those kind of conversations and that they keep, keep going on a project over time and review the data and you know, see how things are going and apply lessons from one to another. I mean, that, to me, seems to be the, uh, one of the gaps sometimes, but also the, the best part too is when that happens and we have some continuity amongst projects and sort of scaling up over time. And we used to have this thing that is dwindling away called the CalFED Ecosystem Restoration Program and the CalFED Science Program. The Ecosystem Restoration Program is fading away unfortunately and it functioned in part with the science program to have a big vision and to work through the details and its apparent demise the people that work there are the ones that spent 20, 30 years thinking about this stuff. And as it kind of filters away into nothingness, their knowledge filters away into nothingness. And there's volumes of reports, and you got to get someone who's working somewhere to say, here, plot, digest this, understand it. And that's a really hard challenge to overcome. 
and so this notion of, of trying to keep this um, synthesis of people who have spent years thinking this through really engaged in this combination of the big picture and how that applies to the specific uh, in a way. And at the same time, one of the things that is really critical is there needs to be this idea of transition planning. This isn't going on for a long time, and you folks in this room are going to be in our shoes 30 years from now or 20 years from now, whatever it may be. And, but you have to get here. And so part of that process is making sure that people that are interested in this stuff are engaged in it and develop the skill set because it's, you know, the key thing is context. You have to have context. If you're studying fish or geomorphology or hydrology, that's wonderful. And then you put it in context, then you can understand what the management questions are that the policy folks are asking and go, oh, I put it over here and it all makes sense. And that's the really critical piece that would do wonders. And so if we can, if, if what the Delta Conservancy is trying to make happen is some sort of um, hub or, you know, sort of a degree of coalesced organization around the development and application of science into all the work that we do, that will work well. And the absence of it is going to be a lot of individual things happening in the landscape, which may or may not be that well fit together and may not take us where we want to go. Perhaps I'll just add two very quickly. Right? You, you, I think a couple of things that are really happening right now to change things. I think this move towards collaborative science, the fact that people realize, do we really want to be arguing, or is there a better way of doing this? And putting together the science plan, or three, four hundred people comment on it over a thousand years. So there's a real willingness, and Val has been a great champion of this, let's not spend all the money on attorney's fees, let's try and get that money into science. I think that's part of it. I think also communicating the science, so I just have to raise it, I'm not sure if that presentation, Robin, that you gave to the council, but in terms of the ability to show this landscape approach. This is what restoration means when you look at what was there before and what we may be able to bring back. And that was one of the best presentations I've ever seen. It was what scheduled for 30 minutes and they built you do you for what, what well over two hours. And people were absolutely fa fascinated in the audience. And I think that did more to raise um, awareness of science, what science can, uh, can do. And you know, afterwards, when the chair was asking you, will this be done by the end of the year? <laughs> what was the connection? It, it also gave the impression of the time scale about how you need to be deliberative in this. So the communication, I, I think, is also very important. So, so I think it's a very exciting time in the next two or three years to see what can actually be achieved at the landscape scale. I have a question. I'm so glad that you brought up CalFed because I feel like at least some people in this industry feel like CalFed was a failure. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, but I think perhaps it's because there was a lot of science but a lack of decision making and a lack of critical thinking about that science that led into decisions. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and how this current process that we're doing now is different or addresses the problems that CalFed has. All I can say is our current process came out of a, a political solution in the state legislature. And political solutions, by definition, include this thing called compromise. And so we end up with something different and with a lot of similarities and interesting. Um, but there's some things that aren't in there that might have been helpful. And so I think, you know, COF had had some issues, um, but it did a tremendous amount to take us forward in certain areas. And and the legislature gave us the Delta Stewardship Council and the Delta Science Program, um, and, but it didn't give us a regulatory program. It gave us a very squishy thing that you know, is helpful, but is, but is not modeled after what San Francisco Bay has had since the 1960s, and that removes, and when you have a regional regulatory structure, you have a mechanism to try to, to get things, to a mandate things are done differently, and that mandate doesn't fully exist Right, so yeah, if, you, if you took the Stewardship Council and made its, its what they call a consistency determination into a permit, you would have a very different world in your hands. And because people would have to get a permit and therefore they would have to do best available science as opposed to say they did and then if no one challenges it, then it sits on a shelf and off, you know, and, and you, you could say I had lunch on Tuesday. And you know, if no one challenges it, that's a valid determination. 
you know, that, that's a little extreme, but, um, you know, but, but that's one, one part of it. And what the legislature was trying to do is balance the land use of the Delta and the culture of the Delta, which is very important, with this water supply question, which is a statewide question, and the ecosystem collapse, which is centered around the Delta, but not solely in the Delta. And that's an incredibly um, difficult challenge to me. And they did a great job in certain ways, and not necessarily perfect in every way. And so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere down the road there's some more legislation that, that turns those knobs and dials, maybe, and that might be for the better or for the worse. And you look at Congress and, you know, you don't want to touch Endangered Species Act because the chance of it getting better is much less than the chance of it getting worse. And, you know, but it's, it's an imperfect law, um, but it, it does provide some benefit here. So CalFed less of some, with some very enduring utility, um, but not perfect. Thank you very much.